Okay, so today we're moving into a discussion of the SQL query language. Last time we looked at the foundations or structure of relations and constraints that are placed on relations. Today we're going to skip from chapter 4 to chapter 6 and look at con some concrete examples of doing data manipulation. Thursday is a continuation of today. I know classes are canceled on Thursday. However, there is a video lecture that you are assigned for Thursday, and there is a quiz on Thursday. So please be aware, even though there is no class on Thursday, there is a assigned videotape lecture plus quiz on Thursday. So we will be spending both I guess today and Thursday on basic queries and then moving on into data description language next week. So if you have your um, textbook, it might help to uh, crack it open to page 112 of the book where it has some of the relations that are there. If not, that's fine too. So the SQL query language is based on something called the select project join metaphor. And this is the metaphor underlying the relational model. So basically all queries fall into kind of these three um, axes, if you will. So select is an operation that filters rows. Sometimes you want to be able to say, I only want to see people making less than $30,000. Or I want to see all employees whose last name is Vanderzanden. So that's an example where you want to filter the rows. That's called a select operation. Then there is project, which filters the columns. So sometimes you don't want to see all the attributes for a tuple. You only want to see a subset of them. So you might want to, for example, if you're a manager, see the salaries of all employees at your branch. Well, you don't, you're not looking to see their gender or their birth date or the number of dependents. All you care about is their salary, maybe their first name and their last name. So there you're filtering or narrowing the tuple. And finally, join allows you to connect information from multiple relations, usually using foreign keys. Remember I said a foreign key was like a pointer. So sometimes you need to basically shove two relations together to form a bigger relation in order to answer a query. So for example, if I said that I want to see all employees who work at, Brant, at the branch at 1678 Cardiff Road. In order to answer that query, I need information from the branch relation, which is going to have information about the street addresses of branches, and I need information from the staff relation, which tells me which branch each staff member works at. So today we're just focusing on select and project, and they're what we call single relation queries. We're only querying a single relation. And then on Thursday, we consider joins, which are multiple relations, queries, and are much more powerful. Okay, so as I was saying, the, um, we're today going to focus on just the single relation queries that revolve around select and project. And you'll see that basically we can handle using select, select, insert, update, or delete. So select is a retrieval operation. The other three, insert, update, and delete, are all operations that are adding, removing, or updating information in the database. But essentially, insert, update, and delete are simply um, using the various commands that you'll learn that are associated with select. 
And this is all very nice. So um, basically, SQL is meant to be human readable, so it's verbose. It's not like C or C++. It's more in the tradition of COBOL, which many of you don't know, but was a business language that was widely used in the 60s and 70s. So SQL is meant to be able to be read by non-programmers. So some of you will find it annoying because they'll seem like the syntax is too flowery. So be it. You just have to get used to it. So you can see um, down here, the last one is a selection query and how it looks. You have some keywords. You typically specify some set of attributes that you want to view. So this part is called the project because we are narrowing the tuple here. The where clause is the filtering. So that's the select that's filtering the rows. And then the from is telling us which relation we're retrieving the tuples from. So pretty easy to follow. The where statement is essentially Boolean algebra. You're using Boolean and relational operators to specify your query. Okay. And you will find that surprisingly much of SQL is case insensitive. So while you will see uh, me frequently, or the examples will capitalize keywords, it doesn't matter whether you capitalize keywords or not. Um, column names in SQL are case sensitive, but not in my SQL. So you'll see that even if certain column names have capitals in them, if you make it all lowercase, it will work properly. The only thing where um, my SQL tends to be case sensitive is for table names. So their sensitivity matters and for literal character data. So those are the two times where case really does make a difference. In fact, let's just see. It may not even make a difference for literal character data here at UT. I'm going to log into. Whenever you're wondering about something, always a good thing to try is to actually log in. Okay, so here you can see that we're capitalizing courses. So CS is capitalized. So select star from courses where, notice I'm not capitalizing the attribute name and I'm not going to capitalize the literal data either, but you'll notice it still came up with the uh, tuple. So my SQL actually also ignores case in its character data. The only place it's going to make a difference is on the relation name. So here, if I capitalized courses, it wouldn't work. Okay, so that's the only time. Relation names for my SQL is the only time where case matters. But for SQL, it's a little bit different. For SQL, um, it also cares about literal character data and field names are also case sensitive. It is case insensitive for keywords. Mm. So let me ask you to please indent your SQL queries nicely, just like you would try to indent a uh, C program nicely. So for example, back here, You'll notice how I was indenting and in each kind of clause of my query came on a different line and it would have been even better probably if I'd indented the from and the where to make it quite clear. So please try to be judicious with indenting. 
Okay. One important thing is that with your character data or your non-numeric uh, data, use single quotes. Don't use double quotes. Okay. In MySQL, you can get away with using double quotes, but it's technically not correct. So double quotes in SQL are reserved for what we call meta information about the database, such as column names. So if you had a space between street and address in the column name, you could still access that field name by putting double quotes around it. So the way that regular SQL distinguishes between meta information about the database and character data is by the way you quote the string. So please get used to using single quotes for your character data. Okay, that's a change because in C and C++ a single quote means what? A character, a single character. It doesn't mean a string. Okay, and of course numeric literals are not enclosed in quotes. Okay, so this is the general form of the select statement. So you select some number of attributes. So right here, what this is really saying is select some number of attributes from one or more tables, filtering on this condition. We'll get to group by and order by. Well, order by means to sort on some column the results and group by is going to allow us to combine rows that have a common attribute in some column. For example, if we want to count the number of employees in each branch, then we would group by the branch number and then all rows associated with branch one would be aggregated, all rows associated with branch two would be aggregated, so on and so forth. So group by is essentially an aggregating operation. Okay, and that's exactly what this particular slide is saying as well. Okay, so the order is important. You go with select attributes from table names where and only select and from are mandatory. Okay, you don't have to filter the rows. So I know that the book has some queries. I'm going to go with our own. So if you remember last time we created a number of tables, courses, student, and student courses. So if we look at courses, whoops, so first of all, when I say select star from courses, I'm saying please show all attributes. And there was no filter, so it shows all of the courses. Okay, now I can say just show me the uh, course ID and the course name. Okay, and now it's down to course ID and course name. And I could add some filters. So notice if I hit return, it will give me an arrow, allow me to continue the command. So I'm going to say where course ID is equal to CS302 or course ID equals AC 140. So you can see here that it's supporting the Boolean operator OR also supports AND and NOT and it also supports the relational operator so we'll get to that in a moment but that gives me those two courses. Okay. I could say or course not equal, and it did not like that. 
So let's use the relational operator instead. Okay, and we pretty much get everything because not that one. The only thing it excluded now was accounting 140. Okay. Um, I could say let's go to another one. So we'll say select star from students. Whoops. There we go. So I could say select last name from student where say GPA less than equal four and GPA greater than or equal to three. Okay, and it gives me several results. Now what do you notice about here that's actually technically a violation of a relation? There's one thing in here that violates what we said about relations last time. Mouse appears twice, and according to the uh, relational model, you can't have duplicate tuples in a relation. So technically, this isn't a valid table. But isn't this a view? It is a view, yes. But it's all views are tables. So basically... In the relational algebra and relational calculus, which are the query languages for the relational model, we say that all operations are closed, meaning that if we apply any operation to a relation or set of relations, the result is itself a relation. So you can see there's a little bit of a lie to that. So technically, if this were, if my SQL were adhering strictly to the relational model, it would show only one version of mouse. Okay, so there is a little bit of divergence between theory and practice here. Theory says that the result of this query should only have been van der Zand and mouse coyote ape. And that is because in theory, all operations on relations are closed, meaning that the result is itself a valid relation. This is not a valid relation. However, this is what a human expects, right? When we ask for all people who have a GPA between 3 and 4, we expect to see all individuals. Now, you may have noticed that there was something called select distinct. So if I really wanted to get rid of duplicate rows, I would say select distinct, and now it will remove any duplicate tuples from the result. So by default, it's select all, so all rows get selected. Okay. So all relational operators are supported, the Boolean operators and, or, and not. Because SQL is somewhat verbose. There's some other ones you should be familiar with. So this is a range, right? GPA less than equal four and GPA greater than equal three. So a lot of people don't think that way. So there's another one introduced where you can say where GPA between 3.0 and 4.0 and you get the same outcome. Okay, except we're missing one of the mouses. So it should be, pardon? Oh, do I have select distinct there? Yes, I do. Let's get rid of select distinct. There we go. So we got all five. So there is the between. So if you have a range query, you can use between. If you have, going back a few queries... This one, where you have to do a bunch of ors, you can actually say in. So I could say in the set CS302 or AC140. So in is syntactic sugar that allows us to avoid having to say or, or, or. Basically says select 
any tuples that are in this that satisfy or are equal to the values in this set. So in is another one. And then there is a modified version of regular expressions. So let's say we want everything that starts with uh, M. We could say select from courses where course ID like, now uh, let's do C. And then this is the wildcard character. Instead of using star, they used a percent sign. So the percent sign means zero or more occurrences of. So this one returns all courses that start with a capital C. Okay. If I wanted anything that was in the middle, I could have said that. And now two more rows got added because accounting has a C in the middle. So like is basically say, saying match a regular expression, but it's very limited. Mm -hmm. So percent sign is the wildcard character. If I want it to say, give me all ones that are start with a C, but are four characters, I would do that and get nothing. So the underscore says matches anything, but it's just a single character. So for those of you familiar with regular expressions, what is underscore most like in, say, Perl? Period. So the underscore character is like the period in Perl, and the percent sign is like the asterisk in your, um, Perl. So very restricted, though. That's pretty much all you get as far as being able to say like. Okay, so that's very helpful though for certain types of numeric data. I'm sorry, non-numeric data. Very useful for um, getting you stuff for textual information. Okay, so basically this is just summarizing it. So star, again, will select all columns, providing a list of column names will restrict it to just those columns. The use of distinct will remove duplicates. Okay, calculated fields. I didn't show you that, but you can do simple arithmetic on fields. So if I wanted to find the monthly salary of my employees, I could say salary divided by 12. In when I was uh, calculating your grades in CS102, code assessor accounts for one quarter of your grade in many cases. And so what I would have done in that case Let's get it from GPA. Well, can't do that. I'll say last name. I would say GPA divided by 4, and sometimes I would round. So I would say round GPA divided by 4, and that would divide everything by 4 and round. So that can be helpful for just doing simple arithmetic operations on your results. You can do more complicated stuff, but generally you only want to do simple arithmetic on it. Okay, you can rename your column. So often when you have a computed field, you want to give it a nice name. So you can say as, and that will appear as that particular column in the result. So here, if I do that again and say as result, you see that it comes out as last name result, whereas up here it came out literally as round GPA divided by 4. So the as allows you to name computed columns. Okay, we've gone through the simple 
uh, search conditions. Okay, here's an example where I negate could have negated, so I could say not between. So that'd be an example of using the not operator. Okay, there's that set membership. There's the pattern matching. Okay. Here's an important one that will trip you up occasionally. Sometimes you want to find, remember null is a valid value for an attribute. It simply means a value is unknown or has not been provided. So we might want to view all viewings for a property that where the comment was null. So maybe we want to reprimand the real estate um, agent because we want all of our clients to provide comments. So we want to find all viewings for property PG4 where no comment was made. So if no comment was made for a viewing, the agent answered null. And if you want to test for null, you can't say equal null. It doesn't work. You have to say is. Okay, that's important. You can't say equal no and get the right answer. You have to say is or is not. So if I wanted all viewings that had a comment, I would say and comment is not no. Okay, this may trip you up, in, especially in the um, graduate project, it can end up tripping you up. So is no is not no. Okay, sometimes we want to sort, and to do that, you give the order by, and it will sort according to that attribute. By default, it's in ascending order, so alphabetical order is ascending. Um, if you say DESC, that means you want it in descending order. So if I go back here, and I want GPAs, so select star from student order by GPA. It comes up ordered by GPA. I could say ordered by GPA DSC. Now I see the best students first. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say that I select star from student ordered by last name. And you can see that Minnie and Mickey appear to be out of order, right? That's not usually the way we display things when there's a tie. In fact, Jerry should be first, then Mickey, then Minnie. It's exactly the opposite of what we expect. So you can specify a secondary sort. So I can say first name, and now it comes out properly. So the first one you put is the primary sort key, then the second one is the secondary, if you put a third one that becomes a tertiary, so on and so forth. Okay, the next thing is sometimes we want to aggregate stuff. So for example, we want, may want to know how many mouses we have in our, among our students. So we could say select count star where last name equals mouse. And that didn't like it. Oh, why didn't it like it? Let me ask you the question. Missing the table. So it has no idea where I want to get this from. And it didn't like the way I spelled student. Oh, goody, goody, goody. There we go. So count three. And again, I could rename that column. Or I could find who has the minimum, who has the 
minimum GPA. So select min GPA from student, 0.92. Now, you might think that's not really helpful. Why don't I select the student too? One second. Huh. No one's pushing up the load average. I don't have good connectivity. So why don't I select last name min GPA from student? Do you have this uh, table anywhere like, in, like that, that data anywhere like on the hybrid machines? So? Yes, it's in the so last time I had you when I had you source it, it was create DB dot SQL okay. and it's in there. Thanks. Welcome. Okay, so let's select the second last name min GPA, and it's not liking it. Okay, so oh, you're right. Select last name min GPA from. Okay, so let's see if that's correct. It's not. So Vander Zanden has a GPA of 3.92, but when I did the select statement, it's so I should have come up with Bugs Bunny as the answer, but instead I got Vander Zanden. So what's going on? What's going on is that when you use aggregated operations, you're not allowed to use other columns, which is kind of annoying. Okay, so in this case, instead of giving an error, it simply took the first tuple in the relation, which was van der Zanden, but that's not what we wanted. So that's a shortcoming of the relational model, is that you cannot include other column names with your aggregate operations. There's ways around it, but let's get to our aggregate operations. So there's five of them, count, sum, average, min, max. And sum and average work only on numeric columns. Count, min, and max operate on any type of column. Sum and average, actually, some average min and max all remove nulls, count doesn't. So count will include tuples that have null, whereas some average min and max will remove. You have to be careful about using select distinct with some and average. Why do you think you have to be careful about using select distinct with from and average? You can mess it up because you might have three tuples all with eight, and then you eliminate two of them, it will change your sum and your average. So just be careful with that. Okay, so that's just telling you what I just told you. Count, that's also warning you about distinct. But this is what we get with the restriction. So aggregate functions can be used only in the select list or in a having clause. That's annoying because we can't put them in a filter. We'd like to be able to say select last name from come on my connection is really slow and I'm a touch typist and that really messes me up when my connection is slow. Select last name from student, where GPA equals min GPA. That's an operation you might like to be able to do. You might think, okay, I wasn't able to produce the GPA when the name with the minimum GPA, so why don't I try that? Invalid use of the group function. So, no good. So you can't put this min into a where clause. 
So the only place, whoops, the only place you can do it is you can put it in the list of attributes or you can put it in a having clause. Now this is the second restriction that I just showed you, which is you can't include other column names along with your aggregated attributes. So this one clearly doesn't really make sense. Select staff number count salary. Well, which staff number do we want to associate with, sal with my cumulative count? So that kind of shows you why they decided you can't have other column names. You're aggregating. So how could you associate a specific value in a column with something that's been aggregated? They said that's nonsensical, so they forbid it. Now you can see that MySQL does not forbid it. It just gives you nonsensical results, like van der Zanden having a GPA of 9 of 0.92 when in fact it was 3.92. Okay, so those were the two major restrictions on it. Now, having said that, there is a way that you can get around it, which we will get to. So this is just a taste of where we're going. You can use what are called subqueries. Now, don't worry. We will get to that. So this is just a taste. So I could say last name, GPA, from student, where GPA equals select min GPA from student. Okay, and that worked. That's what's called right here. This is called a subquery. We will get to that. What happens is that subquery returned a value, which was the minimum GPA. Then we compared the GPA with the returned result, and we were able to produce the appropriate last name for that GPA. Now, don't worry about it. This isn't going to come up for another couple lectures, but... Looking at that, what looks like an inefficiency about this query? Remember, we say we don't care about, we only specify what we want, which that certainly specified it. But if you did this literally, something's inefficient. What's inefficient about this query if a query optimizer just went straight at it in a naive way? Well, you're doing two queries instead of one, which means what? What are you, and what do those queries cost you? You're reading the student list twice, when that's really a stupid idea, right? It should be able to solve this query by only reading the students once, but this query, if naively implemented, would make you do it twice. So... This was the reason why it took so many years before SQL databases became commercially viable. The user simply specifies what they want. The query optimizer can't do stupid things like looking through the entire relation twice, at least if you want something that's going to give results in a timely manner. So it took several years of research where they looked at how do you optimize a query like this so that you somehow derive what the user wants, the meaning of what the user wants, and then you only make one pass through the student table rather than two passes. Now, again, we won't get into query optimization in this course, but this is an example of where saying what you want doesn't really provide an efficient for algorithm for how to get it. And the query optimizer has to figure out a more efficient way for how to get it. Okay? So, just a couple more examples here. We use sometimes, when you're counting, you only want distinct things. So, if we want to know how many different properties were viewed in May 2004, 
a property may have multiple viewings. So if we simply asked, whoops, that's not the right thing, but if we simply asked for select count star, or select, yes, select count star as my count from viewing where view date between the 1st of May and the 31st of May, the count would get distorted by multiple viewings of the same property. So we say count distinct property number, and now once it's satisfied the query, it eliminates all duplicate property numbers, and I get the result I want. Okay, you should be able to figure all this out. You're all pretty simple. So now we get into grouping. So sometimes we want to group a set of rows in order to do some computation on them. So for example, give me the average salary by branch. I don't want the average salary of all employees. I want the average salary by branch. I want the average GPA by course. Okay, so that requires grouping. We want to group all the rows associated with a certain attribute together and apply the aggregate operation to each group of rows. And the group by keyword does that for us. Okay, so for example, let's go to an example. Here, we're counting the number of employees in each branch and summing their salaries. So we're saying select the branch number, the count of the number of staff, the sum from staff, grouping by branch number, and ordering by branch number. Now, you see something unusual in this select statement that I told you five minutes ago was illegal. What is illegal about this illegal? I put in quotes because it's not. What can't, what is it supposedly illegal five minutes ago that all of a sudden is legal? Count and sum. Well, count and sum, it's okay. I can't put branch number in there according to what I said. It's okay to um, combine aggregate operations in the same select statement. So I can say select min, max, and average in the same select statement, and that gives me the minimum salary, maximum salary, and average salary. But what I told you you couldn't do, I told you you couldn't put other attributes into the select statement, but here I have. But here's the exception. If you have a group by statement, you're allowed to include any attribute from the group by statement in the select clause. So branch number was in the group by statement, and therefore it's also permitted to put it in the select statement. And that makes sense if you think about it, because I'm grouping by branch number, and I'm doing my count and my sum by branch number, so now it does make sense for each aggregate amount to associate it with the grouped attribute value. So it in fact does make sense to allow the attribute values from the group by statement to be included in the select statement. Okay, that's point one. Point two, and this always gets students on the homework. They think, oh, group by can be used to do sorting. Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Unfortunately, on the homework, usually the answer is yes. But group by and order by are not the same. Order by says to sort the results by this particular attribute. Group by says to group and then apply an aggregate operation. If you want it sorted by branch number, please then say order by branch number. Too many homework assignments come in with the order by clause omitted and then a point or two is taken off, and then there's a lot of gnashing of teeth, but it worked, it sorted it. Well, yeah, it did for that particular time, but it doesn't always work. So if you want to sort your results, use order by.
Okay, so here's the, right here is the modification to the select list rule. So if you use group by, you can still use an aggregate function in the select list. That's the same. You can now use a column name that is used in the group by clause. Okay, you can use constants which are pretty worthless and you can use expressions involving combinations of the above. But generally it's the first two, an aggregate function and the column name. Okay, and two nulls are considered equal for purposes of group by, but typically you're not grouping on null. You don't care about null. Okay, I'm not asking to group to give me the sum of all... Well, you might. I guess you might want to know the sum of all branches plus you might want to know the sum of the salaries of all staff who are not affiliated with any branch. So in that case, if you had some nulls in the branch number field for a staff, it would group all the nulls together and you would get all the sum of the salaries for all employees not associated with any branch. Okay, so here's an example result. Branch number three has three, branch five has two, branch seven has one. Now, just like you can use a WHERE clause to filter individual rows, you can use a HAVING clause to filter groups. So let's say I only care about branches whose count is greater than a certain amount. I can use a having clause, and notice, in a having clause, I can include an aggregate function, which I can't do in a where clause. Remember, aggregate functions are not allowed in where clauses, but aggregate functions are allowed in having clauses, because where filters individual rows, having filters aggregated rows. So it is okay, for example, to say having st count staff number greater than one. So here it is. At the bottom right here, we're getting the count and sum of salaries at all branches where the branch has more than one staff member. So group by branch number, having count of the staff number greater than one. Okay, so you might say, okay, Dr. Van Der Zanden just made a big deal of how you shouldn't assume that order by magically sorts correctly. Well, suppose that instead of wanting to sort on branch number, I wanted to sort on count. Then I would have had to say here, order by my count rather than order by branch number. So that's an example where the order by may produce a different result than the group by. Okay, I can't emphasize it too many times because it will be a problem for some of you. You use a where to filter individual rows. You cannot use aggregate operations in where. You use having to filter grouped rows. And in having, you do almost always use aggregate operations. Okay? Because you might say, well, what if I only want in my having clause having branch number equals B1 or B3. So you might say, why not having branch number in, say, B1 
B3. Well, that's nice, but you can do this in another way. Okay, I could have filtered first based on branch number. So I could have said where branch number in B1, B3 Okay, and that would have had the same impact. I would have gotten all the branches with B1 and B3. So the idea with a having clause is that typically you're filtering based on an aggregate function in the having clause. If you find yourself wanting to use a having clause to filter on a non-aggregated thing, chances are you could do that with the WHERE clause. Okay, so, whoops. So please try to hew to that in your, in what you, when you write your queries. So, questions about any of that? Okay. I am going to, I got about 15 minutes, I am going to start into joins because I figure it's better than having you follow through all the online lecture. So we went through, I guess review quickly, we went through all the things you can do on a single relation. So you can do select and project, select is filtering rows, project narrowing the relation you can apply an aggregate operation. That's essentially what you can do with a single relation. Okay, well, frequently, as I said, you want to be able to combine information from more than one table. So here's an example. What address does Brad Vanderzanden work at? Well, if we just look at staff, that's going to be required to get Brad Vanderzanden. Okay, but the staff relation doesn't give the address that Brad Vanderzanden works at. What does what piece of information does it give us that I could use to find the address that I work at? The branch number. The branch number. So, branch number can be used in effect as a pointer into the branch relation, and with the branch number, I can find the street address in the city and the postcode. So in order to perform this query, I'm going to have to find a way to combine those two relations together. And it's called a join because essentially what we're doing is taking two different relations and we are joining them together into a big relation. So we call it a join because we're joining them together. Okay, so let's give the, well, that's not. So let's do the, show you the query here. So if I wanted that query, I would say select. Is that visible? Yes. So I'm just going to say in this case, street, city, and postcode. from, now I need two relations, branch and staff, and what I'll frequently do is use an alias. So you can say from branch B, staff S. So this is kind of like doing a declaration of a variable, but it's really just an alias, so I don't have to keep writing out branch and staff all the time. where s dot last name equals Vanderzanden and s dot branch number equals b dot branch number. 
So this is called the join right there. So this is using the foreign key branch number from the staff relation and combining it with the primary branch number or primary so branch number is a primary key in the branch relation. So basically it finds the one tuple that's equal to van der Zanden. Then it takes that branch number and says, I want the tuple in B, which is the branch, that has that branch number. And then it's able to extract the street, city, and postcode from that. In effect, what happens is we get one big relation out of it. So in fact, you end up with a branch staff relation. Conceptually, you end up with a branch staff relation, which has the attributes branch number, street, city, postal code, staff number, first name, last name, you get the picture, and a second branch number. So the duplicated piece of information then there is branch number. But conceptually, you can think of there only being one branch number. So kind of the join attribute Conceptually, you wouldn't duplicate it. And then it's pulling from that. Okay? So the comma separates the different relations. You can use an alias for the um, different relations. Just try to use meaningful ones. Yes? I think so. I think you're going to get an error message if you... Mm, let's try it. So, select star from staff as S. You didn't like that, whereas um, it doesn't... student as S. Uh, it liked it, so it doesn't... Uh, a sec. Yeah, it seems to be okay. Select star from student as s where s dot id is less than yeah it's fine so but you don't need the as okay the other reason you might use it is sometimes there can be an ambiguity so you might, for example, in this case there was no ambiguity because all of the attribute names were distinct, but it's possible that there might be some uh, overlapping things. So let's say for some reason we had city in here. Maybe for some reason we keep the uh, city where the person lives. Now the city is ambiguous up here because city is an attribute in both branch and staff. So now I would have to prefix it with b.city so that it was clear that I was pulling the city value from the branch relation rather than from the staff relation. So they also, but I could have also written it out. I could say branch.city, it's just more work. Okay, so joins pretty simple. Here's another one. In this case, I'm listing the names of all clients who have viewed a property along with any comment they supplied. So there's two relations here, the client relation and the viewing relation. And all we care about is that the 
client number matches the client number in the viewing relation. And for that, you can see we had to distinguish that we wanted the client number from C because that's a duplicated attribute. And we want it first name, last name, property number, and comment. Okay, here's another one. Let's do this one. So we have one called student courses. Oops. So let's say that, so this gives us a student ID, course ID. So let's say that we wanted the students. Actually, I'll let you do this query. Suppose that we want to find the grades of all students in CS140. So the query I want, let you do this, is put it up here. So I want list the names of all students, list the names and grades of all students who took CS140. And if you don't have it, the I'll list the describe student, describe course, and describe courses. Come on. Okay, that should actually be enough for you to answer this query. So I want you to list the names and grades of all students who took CS140. Try and figure out if you can write that query. Okay, so let me show you. So we want to select the first name, last name, and grade. So we're taking two attributes from student and one attribute from student courses from student, student courses, where the course ID is equal to CS140 and now I could say in fact 
So student dot, I forgot to put my aliases in. So and student dot student ID is equal to, I'm sorry, student dot ID equals student courses dot court, I'm sorry, student ID. Okay, so I find out that those four students took CS140, and those were their grades. Now, normally, you would have the same name for the foreign key as you did for the primary key. So even though in this case, the student courses used student ID, and the student relation used ID, generally, you would have used the same field name here for student courses. So you would have also said ID because it would have made it clear that it was the same as ID in the student table. So one final parting thought is it's not important for your attributes to have unique names across relations. In particular, your foreign keys should typically have the same name as the primary key that they are um, pointing to. So in this case, really, student ID should have been ID in student courses. Okay? So remember, do those quizzes. Remember, there is no class Thursday, but there is an assigned video lecture, and there is an assigned quiz for Thursday.